again. So, today we're going to talk about common fractures, enthesopathies, and tendinopathies. I'll try not to do this too much, or this, because I've heard that's very disconcerting during lectures, so I'm going to try and stay calm. Um, key concepts. After completing this lecture, you should have a basic understanding of how the skeletal structure of the upper extremity, particularly the elbow, wrist, and hand, controls mobility and defines injury patterns. The learning objectives. Understand the skeletal structure, <laughs> skeletal structure, that was good, the skeletal structure of the elbow and wrist and how it defines motion. Describe the most common fractures of the hand and wrist and some fractures that do not readily heal. And lastly, describe the pathophysiology of enthesopathies and tendinopathies. I don't know if you know this, but pronouncing that last bullet point was really tough, but I, I got through it, so I'm going to congratulate myself. Um, introduction. The hand defines most of our tactile interaction with the outside world. It's very unique and specialized compared to other inhabitants of the planet. The hand has receptors for position sense, vibration, temperature, and fine tactile discrimination. And in fact, in order to read Braille, you have to be able to discriminate points that are two millimeters apart. So it's very important um, to maintain the health of the hand and your nerve receptors. Unlike virtually all non-primates, we have opposable thumbs. That, along with our reasonable sized brains, have helped us to develop the fine motor skills necessary to develop and refine tools. Luckily, this article is from The Onion. It's fake news. Um, if dolphins ever get opposable thumb, we're basically totally screwed. Um, this is a primitive axe that they have made out of driftwood and shells that's believed to be their handiwork using their newly opposable thumbs. Um, motions of the elbow, wrist, and forearm. The elbow is a trochogingelimoid joint. Basically, that's a pivoting hinge, and it allows for flexion, extension, and rotation. I tend to like to think of the forearm as one joint instead of two, because there are two articulations, but they're both between the radius and the ulna, one at the elbow, one at the wrist, and they allow for the radius to rotate almost completely around the ulna, with on average 150 to 160 degrees of forearm rotation. Palm up rotation is referred to as supination and palm down rotation is referred to as pronation. The wrist is comprised of two rows of carpal bones, if you recall from Gross. The scaphoid, lunate, and triquetrum are really the, the, the hard workers of the proximal carpal row. The pisiform just sits on top of the triquetrum and has a couple um, tendon and ligament attachments and is mostly along for the ride and functions as a sesamoid bone. The distal carpal row is comprised of the trapezium, trapezoid, capitate, and hamate. The scaphoid really forms a link between the proximal and distal row because as you can see from the depiction, the scaphoid really is, is part of, of uh, both rows. And so when you have a problem with the scaphoid, either through a ligament injury or a scaphoid fracture, it disrupts its communication between the proximal and carpal distal or carpal rows and can cause a lot of uh, associated pathology. The skeletal structure allows for multi-planar motion. So it's not just usually like radial and ulnar deviation, but there's also flexion extension and rotation, which allows you to position your hand in space in many different positions. Now, this is getting through some potentially testable information. The scaphoid is a very interesting bone. It's almost completely intraarticular and almost completely covered in cartilage. So if you recall from some of our fracture healing lectures from uh, a little while ago, that eliminates a mode of fracture healing. If there's no periosteum, you can't really form callus because the entire um, bone is in the joint pretty much and there's no periosteum. So it makes it more difficult for a scaphoid fracture to heal based on those two factors. That's completely intraarticular and it's almost completely covered in cartilage. Fracture mechanism. Ligaments and tendon attachments determine the pattern of fractures. And, and really, what is hurt depends on the rate of force application, the magnitude of force application, and um, what the weakest link is. So if you have a rubber band, which would be a good example of this, if you take a rubber band and you stretch it really, really slowly, you're gonna be able to stretch it more before it fails. If you pull a rubber band really quickly, it will fail sooner. So that has to do with the rate of force application. 
That is the lateral condyle of the distal humerus. And so in this case, it fell partially through bone and partially through a growth plate because in this case, the ligament attaching to the bone was stronger and so it pulled off that piece of bone. And so that really, it depends on, again, magnitude, direction, skeletal maturity, condition of bone. So in, in growing people who have growth plates, the growth plate's made out of cartilage, which is weaker than bone. So if you apply a force to, let's say, a knee or an elbow, it will usually fail through the growth plate as opposed to failing through the ligament. In someone who's skeletally mature, they may be more likely to fail through the ligament than the bone. The role of deforming forces in fracture displacement. The direction and magnitude of the applied force affects the fracture pattern, as well as the shape of the bone and the surrounding anatomy also have big bearings on the fracture. Each fracture has kind of its own personality, and so you can tell by looking at the x-ray pretty much how the force was applied. So a simple transverse fracture which is just straight across the bone, would usually be by a force applied perpendicular to the bone. A linear fracture would imply more of a compression. An oblique or kind of more, you know, spiral type fracture would imply that there was more of a twisting mechanism to it. Magnitude of force. If the bone is broken into two pieces, that implies less force. If the bone is broken into a lot of pieces, that implies more force. Also, host factors. If I see someone who's 25 and has a distal radius fracture in multiple, multiple pieces, that implies that a lot of force had to happen to make that fracture occur with multiple pieces because the bone's a lot stronger. If I see someone who's 75 and they fall and break the wrist into many pieces, that could just be a fall from standing height. So host factors and bone condition play a big role in fracture pattern as well. Why do some bones in the hand heal better than others? Again, you see a slide with three or four bullet points. This is potentially testable information. The scaphoid is the most commonly fractured carpal bone. So distal radius fractures and metacarpal fractures are more common than scaphoid fractures, but of the carpal bones, the scaphoid is the most commonly fractured, probably because it shares a position between the, in both the first and second carpal rows and makes it a little bit vulnerable to fracture because it's longer and, as I'll show the mechanism of common fractures, its position relative to the radius affects its ability to be fractured. With proper care, most scaphoid fractures heal, 90 to 95%, which sounds like a lot, but for a fracture, that's not a high rate. If you break your radius or you break a metacarpal, that's gonna heal almost 100% of the time. Um, the scaphoid fracture mechanism, this is what I'm talking about, so basically, when someone falls on an outstretched hand, the radial styloid comes right across the mid portion of the scaphoid, which is, which is its narrowest portion. So it gets bent across the radius and trapped between the hand and the base of the thumb and the radius. And this is the so-called fouche or fall on an outstretched hand mechanism. And that's the most common way in which scaphoid fractures occur. Again, this is, I would say, at least for my, my uh, questions, if you see a slide with four bullets describing one thing or features of one thing, that's probably going to be on the test. So here are the factors. I'll slow down for those of you speeding the video up. Factors contributing to non-healing scaphoid fractures. I'm going to talk normally now. Um, poor blood supply. Well, you know, normal is a relative term. Poor blood supply. Delayed diagnosis, and that's because the scaphoid, as we said, is covered completely in cartilage, so you can get a crack through the bone, but the scaphoid is still held together. So you may not see the fracture right away on an x-ray, because if it's a totally non-displaced fracture, the crack can be there and you're not gonna see it. The fracture will become evident in a few weeks once your body tries to heal the fracture. One of the things that happens is you get new blood vessels growing across the fracture site. When that happens, you get some bony resorption and that creates the line that you see on x-ray. The other thing depends on the beam of the x-ray. If the x-ray is not exactly perpendicular to the fracture, 
You may miss it. You may not see it if it's present. So both of those factors. But oftentimes, scaphoid fractures are not evident on the initial x-ray. And so if you see someone in the emergency department and they're tender over the scaphoid in the anatomic snuff box or scaphoid tuberosity, you're going to treat it as if it's a fracture and send that patient home in a cast or some type of immobilization. Factor number three, intraarticular location. The scaphoid is almost completely covered in cartilage. There's no periosteum, and so there's no callus formation, and there's no, and there's no contrib contribution from the periosteum of healing cells that you see in long bone or extraarticular fractures. Mechanical instability. We talked earlier how the scaphoid is sort of a bridge between the proximal and distal carpal rows. Once you disrupt that, the proximal scaphoid moves with the proximal row, and the distal scaphoid stays relatively fixed. So that's not a good thing for fracture healing. Too much motion equals um, a higher incidence of non-union. A tiny bit of motion, tiny bit of like micro motion in the fracture site can be good. Um, for a long bone fracture, it can contribute to callus um, because if you rigidly immobilize a bone with a plate and screws and you don't get indirect healing, again, we'll cover that in, in, we probably already covered it chronologically in one of my earlier lectures, but we'll get to that. This is a slide showing scaphoid blood supply. Um, the top of the scaphoid is the part that is connected to the trapezium. The bottom part of the scaphoid is the part that articulates with the radius. So the blood sort of goes backwards. The main vessel that supplies the scaphoid enters distally along the dorsal radial aspect of the scaphoid and then comes back proximally towards the wrist. So, the closer your fracture is to the wrist or proximal scaphoid, the higher the non-union rate is because the blood supply is worse. This is a scaphoid MRI. So this is someone who had pain, um, but you couldn't see anything on the radiograph and the fracture is only evident on MRI early on if it's totally non-displaced. As I said before, it might not be evident for two or three weeks. If someone's got tenderness, you immobilize them. If you want to try and get an early diagnosis, MRI is extremely helpful. How to improve scaphoid healing? Well, you could improve blood supply, and people have tried that, taking vascularized bone graft and trying to plug it into the scaphoid. And that kind of makes sense, but it doesn't really work all that well. But the things we can do really well are we can restore mechanical stability. So basically putting a screw between the fragments that makes the scaphoid stable, and it also compresses the two fragments together, both of which are very good for fracture healing. So this shows a scaphoid fracture with a screw across it. Um, anyone here who's a woodworker would may question the fact that the threads go all the way on the screw. So how are you going to get compression if the threads cross the site? Um, well, in this case, the threads have a variable pitch, meaning the threads are farther apart at the tip of the screw than they are at the back of the screw. So even though there are threads that cross the fracture, as you tighten the screw, in this case it's not a metaphor, you're actually tightening a screw, it pulls the fragments against each other. Most common fractures of the hand and wrist, distal radius fractures, carpal fractures, metacarpal fractures, phalangeal fractures. We'll go through a couple um, examples. Distal radius fractures, also commonly caused by a foosh injury, fall on an outstretched hand, and they often have an ulnar styloid fracture associated with this. Usually, when someone falls on their hand, this is the classical deformity. It's known as a dinner fork deformity because maybe, if you use your imagination, close your eyes a little bit, where they get a little blurry, but you can sort of see stuff that kind of has the same shape as a dinner fork. Um, for those of you who don't use forks, this is a dinner fork, so maybe it looks similar, although there's not that same you know, kind of detailing like you have on, on some forks. Um, boxer's fracture. This is an angulated fracture of the fifth metacarpal, used uh, commonly caused by striking a person or an inanimate object. Usually we'll see uh, walls, lampposts, refrigerators, fire hydrants. I think the term boxer is a misnomer because boxers know how to punch. This is usually from a wild swing where someone's applying an oblique force to the bone causing the fracture because the metacarpals are very strong when you apply a, a load perpendicular to the shaft, an axial load. That's why martial artists will kind of get calluses over their second and third metacarpals and they'll strike directly because that's the, strong, the strongest um, orientation of the bone. That if you apply a load perpendicular um, to the surface or basically just in line with the axis of the bone, it's going to be hard to fracture that. So metacarpal uh, fractures usually occur with oblique force and this is the classical distal angulated fifth metacarpal known as a boxer's fracture. Bennett's fracture. Bennett's fracture is a great 
teaching fracture because it really illustrates deforming forces on fractures. So a Bennett's fracture is called by, caused by an axial force to a flexed metacarpal. The carpal metacarpal joint of the thumb, where the first metacarpal articulates with the trapezium, tends to be very lax. And so in certain positions, when the thumb is flexed or adducted, a portion of the metacarpal is not really sitting on the trapezium. And so if you apply a force to it, the little Bennett's fragment, which is still sitting on the trapezium, stays in place and the fracture occurs in the metacarpal along the, right along the line of where the metacarpal was not supported. So you're applying a load to a bone that's partially supported. The supported part of the bone stays where it was. The unsupported, the unsupported part of the bone keeps moving. And so the deforming forces on this end up being the abductor pollicis longus, which continues to pull the metacarpal proximally. Also the adductor of the thumb, which adducts the first metacarpal. So those are basically the deforming forces on this fracture. The small fragment, also known as the Bennett's fragment, is held in place by stout ligaments, the anterior oblique ligament. That part's not going to be on the test, but that's what holds it in place. That's not going anywhere. And so basically when you have this fracture, it's an unstable fracture because the deforming forces are going to continue to pull on the first metacarpal and make sure this fracture stays displaced. So this is typically a fracture that we treat surgically. Phalangeal fractures or, or uh, finger fractures, relatively common, but think of the, fi of the finger bones as small long bones, like miniature uh, femurs or tibias. They have the same fracture pattern as other long bone fractures, and they depend on the mechanism. Avulsion fractures are when you have some soft tissue that will pull a piece of bone off with it. One of the common ones in the finger is a mallet fracture, which involves the bone where the terminal extensor attaches. That's also known as baseball finger, where someone will get a blow to the tip of the finger and either the tendon will fail or the tendon will pull off a piece of bone. And this shows a bony mallet, basically where you have um, a little piece of bone still attached to the terminal extensor and the only deforming force is the flexor. And again, don't totally trust anatomy books because this slide shows the flexor attaching to the tip of the phalanx. It doesn't. In general, this is not, not on the test, but Extensor tendons have articular insertions, like right at the articular margin, and flexor tendons attach at the metaphyseal portion of the bone, not at the distal portion of the bone, as you can see here. But in general, mallet finger can either be a soft tissue or a bony disruption. This is a bony mallet injury because you've just pulled off the extensor, and so the only thing left attached, are, other than the ligaments, are the flexor, which creates a flexion deformity of the distal phalanx. Bony skier's thumb. Skier's thumb usually is a fall on the hand with a thumb abducted and you either tear the ulnar collateral ligament or in this case pull off a piece of bone that is attached to the ulnar collateral ligament. The term gamekeeper um, thumb gets thrown around for this. Skier's thumb is an acute injury. Gamekeeper is a attenuation of the ligament over time. So they both end up with a lax or dysfunctional ulnar collateral ligament but the gamekeeper injury has to do from basically kind of twisting the neck of game that was mostly dead but not completely dead. And over time, bringing the neck of the game would lead to chronic laxity of the ulnar collateral ligament. Skier thumb is an acute injury. It doesn't have to be bony, but it's just different because it's an acute tear. Um, now, getting to enthesopathies. Um, you may want to pause and take a walk now because it's a lot of material, but I'll, I'll keep going. Um, tennis elbow is one of a broad group of disorders known as enthesopathies. Enthesopathies, in addition to being almost impossible to pronounce without really thinking hard, at least for me, are a disorder of a bony origin or attachment. Lateral epicondylitis is the common term used to refer to tennis elbow. Medial epicondylitis is the common term used to refer to golfer's elbow. They're misleading for a couple of reasons. They occur more commonly in non-tennis players and non-golfers, and the ITIS suffix implies that it's an inflammatory condition, which it really isn't. Epicondylosis is a more modern term that we've tried to apply to it, and it really represents more of the actual pathophysiology of the condition, that it's characterized by degeneration of the origin. In the case of tennis elbow or lateral epicondylitis, it's the origin of the extensor carpi radialis brevis or ECRB. This is the MRI appearance where basically, again, how you see things in MRI depends on how fast you spin the magnet. If you spin the magnet pretty fast, it makes fluid light up. In general, cartilage 
tendon, tendon origins don't have a lot of fluid in them, so they should be pretty dark on both T1 and T2. So if you look laterally here um, by the origin of the um, extensors, in particular the extensor carpi radialis brevis, which is a little deeper to the uh, longus and extensor digitorum communis, you see this signal, which shouldn't be there. It should be a uniform kind of black origin. Um, the fluid is because you have changes in the tendon, which makes the tendon more friable, and it can have slow attritional tearing away from that, and so you get a little fluid because the tendon's not firmly attached, the tendon origin is not firmly attached to the bone anymore. So this is a very typical um, MRI appearance of tennis elbow. Histologically, you see disorganized collagen fibers, vascularity, there are no signs of cellular inflammation, so that's kind of why calling it, you know, epicondylitis doesn't really make a lot of sense. Treatment. We don't really know what the optimal treatment is. Um, we try stretching, counter force bracing, which is, you've seen people wear those tennis elbow straps to theoretically offload the origin that may or may not work. Night wrist splinting, holding the wrist in extension to take some tension off of the area. And then there are a lot of modality-based treatments, ultrasound, et cetera, um, none of which have a strong level of evidence. Um, I listed them here. That they're not going to be on the test, but they're multiple different things. I think things that may work in the future, um, things that stimulate collagen growth. So injection of like fibroblast growth factor may stimulate healing of that area. And you get to this is more in the area of almost regenerative medicine. Um, things that we do now, um, taking platelet-rich plasma and re-injecting the site to generate an inflammatory response might work because maybe in your PRP you have some fibroblast growth factor which is stimulating new collagen growth. But again, there's a lot of room for improvement in our knowledge about these enthesopathies and also our treatment. Um, biceps tears, biceps anatomy. So basically, the biceps has a long head and a short head. The long head goes, starts above the glenoid, goes through the shoulder joint, down the bicipital groove, and then ultimately to its insertion on the radius. The short head comes off of the tip of the coracoid process along with the coracobrachialis, and then down to its insertion on the radius. Um, this shows with everything else stripped away, you just see basically the uh, two portions of the origin and then the common or mostly common insertion. It's common for people to get attritional changes in the long head of the biceps. When someone gets a biceps rupture, you can, look, you can rupture approximately or you can rupture distally. The short head almost never ruptures uh, approximately. The long head often ruptures and, and create a deformity. So if you rupture the biceps up by the shoulder, the muscle is going to move down a little bit most of the time and move distal. And that's a pretty common thing. It doesn't require repair because you still have one origin and the insertion intact. When someone talks about operative biceps injuries, they're talking more about a distal biceps rupture because as you can have an injured muscle tendon unit, but if it still crosses a joint, it can still act. So like for the Achilles tendon, if I rupture my Achilles tendon, I can't stand on one foot because it's not crossing my ankle joint anymore. If I have a tear of my calf muscle, it'll hurt, but it will still act on the ankle. So the same thing with the biceps. Proximal biceps rupture, it still crosses the elbow and still works if it's only the long head, which it usually is. If it's a distal rupture, it won't work anymore. And the biceps major function really and its most unique function is, a, is as a strong forearm supinator because the brachialis muscle is also a pretty good elbow flexor. And this just shows um, a, an MRI through the humerus where instead of one biceps tendon, you see two, and this is what an attritional tear of the biceps looks like. Um, and then this is just um, an, arthros an arthroscopic view. This, oh, sorry, uh, arthroscopic view coming down, this is the biceps tendon, this is normal biceps, and this is all tenosynovitis um, and inflammation in the biceps tendon. So this, this change is more inflammatory and can lead to biceps rupture. And again, this just shows disorganized collagen. So as, bicep, as the biceps fails, it tries to repair itself. And so that's why clinically you'll, you'll go in you know, arthroscopically, and you'll see a big broad biceps. Usually when tendons rupture, they do so slowly over time. And so you'll see so some fibers will tear and they'll try and repair themselves and so you'll have a broadened tendon. Sometimes if a tendon fails abruptly, you'll just see two ends of a tendon. 
histologically, this would be a, an attritionally or slowly rupturing biceps where you have disorganized, coll disorganized collagen fibers adjacent to normal collagen. And this shows, now, okay, let's see, 50-50, look, raise your hands. Who thinks this is a proximal biceps versus a distal biceps? Yeah, you're, you're all right, it's proximal biceps. And the reason you can tell is this is the normal biceps. On this side where the arrow is, you can see the biceps muscle has moved distally that indicates that the long head of the biceps ruptures. If the entire muscle moves proximally or towards the shoulder, that would be a distal biceps rupture. And again, this shows a distal biceps rupture, where again, this is the normal side, the left side, or stage left. And then the right side, you can see the muscle has moved proximally. This is someone who, did not, who had a, a distal biceps rupture, but did not have a repair. So the muscle is now retracted proximally and not really working on the elbow or forearm anymore. Um, so summarizing, tendinopathies are chronic tendon disease, um, um, as are enthesopathies. Usually they're not inflammatory. I think, you know, in terms of the biceps, it's a little different, so you won't be asked to test question on that. But for the most part, most chronic tendon things don't have a lot of inflammatory cells if you do a biopsy. You'll just see chronic tendon degeneration and vascular ingrowth. Tears are usually attritional. Again, normal tendons don't usually tear. You don't see usually a 20-year-old athlete tearing their Achilles tendon. You see a lot of 30, 40, 50-year-old athletes or people who call themselves athletes who get ruptured Achilles tendons because the, ten, the, cow, the internal structure of the tendon is not really normal histologically, so it's easier for it to fail. Tendons fail more often with rapid loading, the rubber band analogy, and tendon insertion failures cause a lot more disability than tendon origin failures because once you rupture a tendon insertion, it's not acting on the joint anymore. And of course, this is Arnold. I mean, there's nothing, there's nothing to say about that. Get out of here, it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. What do you want to say about Arnold? His muscles are very defined. This is the young Arnold. Dated, dated cultural reference. Thank you. Now get out of here.